So, okay, so like a while back, Scott and I were talking about how you use the statistics in Canvas to see what pages uh, each student is clicking on. It pulls it up in an Excel file, but it has like, it goes by the student name and it tells you every page they clicked on. So I can no see that. Kidding. So I can see that they clicked on yeah. my, you know, my lecture video page. But then Scott, well, Scott, you brought up a point, is that I don't know if they clicked on the video after that though, and watched no, the video. No, you don't know. So, but 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 I would think um, once I've uploaded the video to Canvas Studio and I'm using it as a Canvas Studio video now, because that's that's what I've been mm -hmm. doing. You would think doesn't Canvas have a built-in way to, for there to look at view counts on a Canvas Studio video? Wow, kinda that's like, a good kind of like that's a good that. question. I don't know. Um... Let me just Google Canvas Studio. It just occurred to me, Slot, with your question. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that, because I could see like maybe, yeah, it's like with Scott, I have like maybe six or seven students out of a whole class are clicking on that page. But then I'm like, yeah, but how do I know they're actually clicking on the video, <laughs> video after that? But is it, is it in okay. Canvas how to yeah. find out how many oh, students it's... clicked on a page? They on have a page, it here. Yeah. Let me yeah. Yeah. Where is it's, that? It's Where under, um, let me, uh, let me pull mine up and, see but uh, you, you know the the new analytics button analytics okay or it says like new new analytics i don't know why i can pull that up too for for a class but maybe according, my, my computer yeah. is like lagging right now with uh, I'll, I'll do it and according to this you can do insights for canvas studio so let's look at um a class and see Taking a second that would be fantastic. Yeah, I know. To know how many students have read your, because I've got, my lectures are written and it's like, it would be really great to know how many students are reading these pages. There's just so much. There's so much. Oh, so Canvas Studio, it's showing it's under video insights. Okay, so I think it's two different places. Yeah, so we can look at both. So if I wanted to go to, um, Let's say I just click on. Oh, I want look to at find, that. And then you go to reports. But you know what I want to do is click on. No kidding. And then it's oh, course, last activity. Option, course activity. So I, I discovered this like week one when I was poking around to try to find this stuff. Huh. So this, the problem with this, it runs this like huge Excel file report. So you got to. Um, yeah, you'll oh, see. 410 results. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at that. When you, when you first look at it, you're like, it's like, well, what am I looking at? But once you kind of like look at each of the headings and categories, you, you figure it right. out. Right. So here is everything. So it shows um, by student and it shows, um, I should hide the students' yeah. names. The page, like on the right column. Now. The page. And it tells you like first viewed, last viewed times of you yeah. participated. So what I would want to do is look for my, um, specifically my announce. Now, the interesting thing is the announcement will show up on the home page, but I don't know if, if it tracks that because I think a student, see now this said they actually went to course announcements, but it doesn't tell me which one. Um, so that's not really going to do what I want. You know, like I want to be able to look at very specific, did they click on announcement for week six? And it doesn't look like that. Let's see, weekly online activity. Um, okay, this has it too, so you don't have to download this way. So this will show me that five students looked at week one discussions. Um, the PDF file, so it's showing by files. So maybe it will show the announcement, let's see. Now my my discussions there's a quiz at the end of every week how can they not how can they take the quiz without opening discussions they have to open discussions in order to take the quiz huh you would think so but but this is actually helpful so um like for a particular article for the week i could see that at least according to this now i wonder if you do a download it says one student read the article by cox one student read um electroacoustic so that I, I think helps me a little bit. What I'm just not seeing is the actual announcement and being able to see, you know, which students clicked on that. Like, okay, week set week seven lecture video, right? What I want them to do is to click on this. And I don't think there's a setting here that will tell me this. If you go to the actual announcement, is is there an option for like statistics or something? This is the announcement here, yeah. Oh, this is yeah, and I don't see any uh, statistics option or anything like that. 
nothing. Um, now it would be on that spreadsheet, I think. But then the question is, if someone has it on the home page, um, on their feed, it's not showing up currently this way. But then you presumably could see it without clicking. So again, that's why I'm thinking, for me at least, it makes more sense to just go to my YouTube. Because um, what I could do, although it's not you know fail safe, I could filter my YouTube results by like geography, but not everybody lives in South Tahoe. But for example, um, week six lecture. So I would click on this and it says there are, I think it said there were 14 views. Now I can do analytics. Let's see what the YouTube analytics involve. How many in the class, Scott? How many in the class? Um, this is only, this is the class with, it's down to five. So I'm thinking if it's unique, then people besides my class would be watching it. Now I could maybe click on engagement. I could click on audience. Um, you can dial down like on geography. So if I get any, for example, from the UK, I'm going to know, well, that's no one in my class, but um, for some reason it's not showing, huh? It's, I don't know if it's even showing where. It just says total. Usually it'll break it down by country or even uh, location. Gender, date, revenue source, subscription status, um, device type. Yeah, it's not going to, to necessarily be great. Now, traffic source could be interesting. Browse features, channel pages, YouTube search. Huh. So I'd have to figure out which one of those would get directed to this type based on it being an announcement in my class. So that it, it's fairly tricky, you know, to get exact information. Now we could check, uh, Justin was asking about Canvas Studio because it said if you go to insights for any video. Now the problem with my videos is I don't use these in class. I um, typically will have these as, as samples and so I don't think the insights, but you would click on insights and then this would show you. So Justin, I think what would happen is it would tell you each of the, the students who viewed it. So that's actually pretty helpful in your case, using Canvas Studio. I'm not using it, I just use it for testing. And as a result, for me, it's not, you know, it's not really going to help because I'm just using this to test. And so I'm not getting any viewers. Why do you not use Canvas Studio? I, I just have always been used to YouTube. You know, I just feel like YouTube is just more powerful. And what Justin was mentioning, some of those issues with upload, I've noticed upload takes a long time. The one thing I like about Canvas Studio is you can go in and do your annotated quizzes. That's really cool. You can't do that on YouTube. So I probably would use it for that. I like that you can do the comments and then students can go in and write comments and annotate at particular points. So that part I actually like quite a bit. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm, uh, I'm yeah. logging in now, but it's just taking a while. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look now or I'll look later. But uh, okay, cool. if you want to do the teaching talk, I don't want to take away from the teaching. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's, I'll, let me just jump on to the topics and then we, we can talk some more. So uh, for Teaching Talk 57, we'll just talk today about two different topics. Uh, first, the value of a class navigation video. And then secondly, we'll discuss student conduct more as a way of just checking in to see how your classes are going. So if any of you need this handout, and let me put it in the chat right now, I meant to do that. Um, if anyone who's watching this after the fact wants to get this handout, just let me know and I'll share it with you. So a class navigation video is really what it sounds like. It's a way to introduce your class to your students. Now that we're close towards the end of fall quarter, we're probably thinking about this for winter quarter. Uh, I've redone how I've approached the navigate navigation video this quarter, and I, I like the results. Again, we're just talking here about how we can tell whether students are watching our Canvas Studio or YouTube videos, but um, that's, that's cer certainly something to assess. Now, the navigation video that I do has all of the, the basics of the class. So I cover the syllabus and all my policies, including late assignment policies, deadlines, I talk about assignments. I go through the whole module structure to explain how the class is laid out. I, of course, talk about the readings, how they do their discussions. I do a short bio at the beginning just to kind of personalize myself. I think it's really important to not only explain your class, but to personalize it by talking about who you are, what you do, and it gives a lot of credibility. So if Justin is talking about 
all his expertise in languages and biblical studies and University of Manchester and all that history of, of his studies and Solange, you're talking about your studies and working in the industry. It really gives like, you know, credibility to your instruction in a class because they're like, oh, wow, this is an expert I'm working with. And that really is exciting. And I know that, you know, they're not only um, an expert, but they're approachable and they're um, giving me their personal take on stuff in, in this um, intro video. You can also give your instructor contact, how to get in touch with you best, uh, if you do phone or if you do email or Canvas inbox. And I mentioned on here that one thing I discovered this quarter is I've done follow-up videos. I had students struggle with one, uh, the first of the three papers in the cultural class. So I, I decided to create these short um, assignment videos that talked about how to do the assignment. So they just did an activity in one of their classes with a um, online game where they had to look at spending and household income and how to spend their money. And it's a simulation and then they have to write a paper about it. So I explained how to do the simulation and also how to write the paper. And at the end of that, I talked about some of the grammar issues I was noting, spelling issues, word count issues. So I find like the navigation video is not going to cover everything in the class, but you can always do some follow-up videos later. What I like to do, and I'll show you mine in a second, is when I do the um, walkthrough video, I use the student view and then I just do the screen capture. You could do that with you know any program you have. Canvas Studio makes it pretty easy to do that. In addition to the getting started video, I really recommend a getting started module. And on the handout, you can click on the image and it'll take you to a sample of this in Canvas Commons. You could download this if you want. What I like about this is it has a lot of our policies. So for our second topic today, talking about student conduct rules, you can um, look at the policy I've set up and it will actually link you to the LTCC student conduct rules. Um, and actually it looks like in this case, oh, maybe I have to put that file in. It looks like it's missing our file, but I do have that also available on our syllabus page that you could download from Canvas Commons. So the course navigation video and the navigation module is taking students through the first part of the class. So if you look at my cultural anthro class here, um, I think I'm on admin, I need to go to dashboard. What I've done is I've created a module at the beginning that shows students everything they need to know about the class. And there's some order to this. So you start off with navigate the class and this talks about how you should start the class, watch the video, and then the idea is the students would just use the next button to go through and look at the writing policies, look at the policies related to plagiarism. And I try to incorporate like written text and then a, a mini video for this. So it's actually multiple videos. It's kind of a ton of work, but my idea is I'll use this in future classes. So I spent hours and hours getting all this together. This class was an entire restart from the beginning. There was nothing new, um, nothing old that I used in this class. So it was, it was definitely a ton of work. Um, but I think hopefully it'll pay dividends later. So my sample, if you want to click on it, this is my walkthrough video. And I'll just show you the topics here. So again, it, it's somewhat long, but the idea is students can use the indices in um, YouTube and they can just click on the topic they want or they could scroll here and click on the time index and then they go to that section. So it's everything from talking about the modules, as I mentioned, how I do my lectures, my quizzes, my deadlines, my makeup policies, um, closing thoughts and all that. So 29 views. Again, it may not be everybody from my class, but hopefully 10 out of 30 or so students watched this video and took it in and hopefully that helped them with their class success. So again, kind of to summarize that, my main idea is to um, give students a perspective walking through the class. What I recommend is start your class when you're getting ready to do the video. Click on student view, which is that purple view. I'm forgetting the title. I, I created a getting started quiz. And so the getting started quiz is my one way of testing them. According to the guidelines in writing, the voice you're writing should be first person, second person, third person in the style that you see fit. And so the idea is that they could complete this quiz and then hopefully they're encouraged to look at all the areas. And what I try to do is to make sure that every area of my policy module, my getting started module, which is also covered in the getting started video, that all of these get covered with at least one question in the getting started quiz. So hopefully they're doing it also because they're they're getting quizzed on it. Are you um, are you doing different videos for different elements of your syllabus? 
and putting them into a get started module, all, all different yeah. types, different videos for different yeah. parts of your syllabus instead of all one video. Yeah, so I'm doing both. So I'm doing the big, um, the one I just showed you here, which is the course navigation. So that's start to finish, walking the students through the class. And then I'm also doing what you're saying is I'm doing a separate video just on, say, their discussions. And that video, I'm trying to remember how long that is. It's it's definitely shorter than the the main video. Um, but so it's kind of redundancy. So it's it's like you get it in this section and you also get it in the... Um, getting started video. Now, Justin, have, you do. Yeah, go ahead, Solange. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say what I've done in my class, I've kept it really simple where I have the yeah. syllabus with all of the elements that you have on the screen. I have mm -hmm. all of the elements, but n my intro video is basically about me and what to expect in the class. So That's it's not great. that long. Yeah. But then every single week, week, the very beginning of the week, the very first page is a video of me yeah. talking about that week. So I've I do done that too. 12 videos plus yeah. 13. Yep. Okay. I do the same thing. So I do my lecture videos as well. And the thing is in the lecture video, I end up doing a lot of repetition. So I talk about the content, but then at the beginning, like I talk about here's the class format. So I'm, I'm discussing it for a third time. Here are the themes, here are the readings, here's the media. I didn't really do the jam boards, they didn't work. But I talk about this just to reiterate the content to say, okay, make sure you you um, are doing things correctly, make sure you watch my videos and so forth. So yeah, I'm doing a, a, a weekly video as well in addition to all those intro videos. So yeah. I got now, all Justin, your bases covered, yeah. Yeah, now Justin, what are you doing again? You're doing, um, you do a navigation video, right? Yeah, so I, um, uh, you know, I finally got kind of access to Canvas, um, mm -hmm. like with, with maybe a couple, two, three weeks before the term started. Um, so yeah, Scott helped me. Um, he gave me his. I think mean, he gave me access to your anthropology. Yeah, class. the class. So, yeah, so right. I, so I, I largely cannibalized. Uh, oh, that's cool. The stuff you were doing. Do. So, yeah, I created a navigation yeah. video, um, like all my headings for my. The week before my first week, the sort of introduction to the class week, I pretty much used the same headings. I used a lot of your verbiage. I I tweaked it based upon stuff I saw, like in the syllabus snippets file mm -hmm. that we have. And yeah, so I mean, I didn't completely, you know, it wasn't copy paste, but um, I largely yeah. used that, and I did I did that, and I found it really helpful. One thing that I need I, I want to do for my next class, which um, you mentioned with the personalized bio and Solange mm -hmm. said that she does this is I want, I need to do that because I, in my navigation video, I just jump right into the course and it was always in the back of my mind, like, oh, maybe I should have kind of like introduced myself a bit more and, you know. Oh, you totally maybe, should, yeah. Yeah, and and I just didn't do it because the video was already like uh, about an hour long. It was because I was kind of going through the syllabus. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, oh, it would have been even longer. So I didn't do that, but I regret it. Um, so I definitely want to do that. I did, I did introduce yeah. myself a little bit and um, I had like an introduce yourself discussion post that everyone mm -hmm. had to do. And so, um, so I said, I'll go first. And I kind of like introduced myself there and had a photo of myself. So that was my means of doing the personalized bio. But yeah, I think I'm going to re-record a new one for, you know, next, the other classes I'm going to be teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm definitely going to like start off with that, um, and do that. But yeah, I basically did what you did. So, <laughs> oh, that's but, great. Yeah. Um, Justin, would it be, um, easier? on the students if your if your um, navigation video instead of being an hour long what if you did it in sections instead of having one big video do it in small yeah, sections could. yeah so i i also thought about that too after it cuz like scott you said you had your navigation video and i i noticed that you also had your individual videos yeah. for like you know academic dishonesty and plagiarism you had a video on like writing guidelines you had it. so when i saw that i um, i thought about doing that so i might do that swatch so actually going forward is yeah. like you said rather than just one whole video i just do like a separate video for each um like one on the syllabus kind of and then one mm -hmm. on writing guidelines one on plagiarism so on and so forth i and would say each, whatever each works. Of be like 10 yeah. 15 minutes or something i'll, I'll yeah. probably yeah that's a good idea yeah whatever works i don't you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't hear anything definitive as far as will students watch. I think there's a theory here at the college a lot. People say, well, if videos are too long, 
then, um, you know, students won't watch them. And I'm kind of like, but then do you not assign um, the Odyssey? Do you not assign the Iliad or, or you know, remembrance of things past? Like, like, uh, like, do you not assign long books? So I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason to this as far as a short versus a long video. I would personally say do what works for you and then guide your students appropriately. So I, again, I think if I have a quiz on this, I will get some views. So if I, th if I drop the quiz out, if I just eliminated that for the next time, I don't think very many people would watch it, whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. So, but that's just my guess. I, again, I don't know. I know people are very particular about the length of videos. I love long movies. I love slow movies. I love 2001. That's like a three hour movie. So I don't buy the thing that I hear from colleagues at the college that, you know, if videos are too long, they won't watch them. But, but do what works best for you, I guess is what I would say. Yeah. Solange. I as, a, I, I, as if I were a student, if it's longer than 20 minutes, I'm not going to watch it. Mm -hmm. If it's, if it's uh, too much reading, I'm not going to read it. Right, right. There is that. Uh, yeah, it could be if the assignment takes too long, if the assignment um, takes more than an hour, or if the text is too long. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Um, and that's just something we com we deal with. I was going to say we combat, we try to, I guess, but I think we deal with that regardless of what we're um, teaching. Now you can refer to that the so-called Carnegie unit to say like a certain number of hours outside of class are required each week because I think students do sometimes complain. I did get a few students this quarter who had some issues with sports and so forth, and I did give a few makeups. I felt like okay, I checked the soccer schedule; it was legit, but. What I responded to kind of as we talk about our sec second topic today, student behavior was they said, you know, you know, your um, soccer schedule ahead of time, you've got to plan better. We're not meeting in person, whether you need to do this on Sunday night or Tuesday morning at 5 a.m., you need to do it. And I said, I won't make an accommodation for you the next time, because being a student athlete means that you are um, required to balance athletics and academics. And I sometimes think we forget the academic side of things and we say, well, there's an accommodation, but it's also like they need to plan ahead because you have seven days in a week. And if you can't figure your schedule out in such a way to do, finish your assignment, then maybe you can't do athletics and sports, uh, you know, athletics and sports and academics at the same time, you know, and of course they have to maintain certain GPA and certain, you know, class enrollment requirements, but Solange, I think what you're talking about is always, you know, an issue, just the motivation and whether it's a video or a long reading, we're always challenged, I think, to get students to, um, you no, know, I, I think it's, time. I think it's the new generation too. I mean, yeah, yeah, TikTok yeah. and, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah, Instagram yeah. and everything, everybody wants yeah. instant satisfaction. So it's, it's yeah. a new, it's a new world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, for sure. Yeah. And it's odd to me because I, you know, if they were in person, they'd be sitting there for over an hour, maybe take right. a break. Two hours. Maybe take a break, come yeah. back, you know, <laughs> restroom break, come back another hour. That's right. If it um, wasn't person, it'd be totally different. Yeah. And I, and I had classes when I was, you know, doing my studies, um, the, what we had, it was hybrid style. So we, and I had recorded lectures and like, I was, I'm kind of a scholar. I loved it. Some of them were, you know, an hour, over an hour long. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah I can yeah. sit there and watch it. It's just like, yeah. I was in, in the class. So I don't know, but I agree with Solange. I think it's a, a generational thing now or something. I, I thought that for a long time, but I've noticed it. Um, but yeah, the, the thing on student behavior, I have some, some interesting uh, experiences with that. Um, yeah, essentially. Yeah. So you know what I do? The truth is on these, they're not that necessary because I just almost read through these verbatim. I say, okay, the first rule is make sure you follow my writing guide. The second rule, make sure you know the student conduct standards. So it, it's really repetitive, but the reason I do this is not just redundancy, but I know some of our students are more what they call the visual, you know, the different kind of kind of learners out there. So I feel like you have an option, you can watch the video version or you can read it. So that's kind of why I think I've done it. I've, it's a little bit to want to have redundancy, but another is just to say, if you don't want to read this, you could just watch the short video. And these are very short. They're like a couple minutes, three or four or five minutes. Whereas I have the one really long walkthrough. And if you didn't see this, the long walkthrough video, um, this is where, you know, the students could look at the various themes and then they could click on these based on 
what area of content they want to look at. This is for my lecture, but my, my navigation video does the same thing. So if they just want to learn about readings, they click on 14 minutes and it takes them to the section on readings. And by the way, that's one of the real reasons I use YouTube over Canvas Studios. I, I feel like the way they do these um, the indices, it's, it's a little easier, I think, for the, the viewer to use. You could set that up with comments on Canvas Studio, but I like YouTube just because it's, it's very um, easy for me to, to navigate and to edit and so forth. So, Does, uh, does YouTube caption what you're saying? Do you have yep. it in writing as well? Yep. So here's the caption. Um, and they're pretty good. They don't do the commas. Um, what you can do is when you click on your editing of the video, um, there is a section where you can adjust your uh, transcript, uh, I think under subtitles. This will show you everything, and I believe you can will overwrite your existing English draft. Okay. So yeah, what you could do is you could take this whole file and then you could copy that into Word. So that is the transcript of my, all the auto transcript by YouTube. The only thing it won't have is punctuation. So that's a little bit of a bummer. And I heard with screen readers that um, there's always concern about punctuation and, and things like that. So you could go in and edit everything. It's just, it's very time consuming if, if you do your transcript edit. And they don't get proper names. Like if there's any name of a person like Malinowski, it may not have Malinowski capitalized or something. Yeah. So that's the transcript. Now I'm going to discard changes. Hopefully it still will do the, the is that what you're talking about, Solange, the, the captions? Okay, cool. Yeah, so those yes. are the captions. Hopefully they're still there. Topic, Let's see. They're still there. Okay. Um, so let me mention, um, and I'm going to keep it. There's a reason I never use that app-specific screen sharing because I always forget and then <laughs> people watching don't get to see the information. But so the second part of today is just talking about student conduct as a way of a check-in. If you want to watch previous videos on student conduct, just click on the handout and there's a whole one pager that has everything ranging from talking about nurturing to plagiarism, um, class writing. I thought that was a very good one when we talked about challenges with writing, uh, teaching and social media, key concepts, race, virtual engagement. So check out that if you want our previous uh, teaching lectures or talks on that subject. Again, go to our syllabus page in Canvas Commons. And if you do that, you'll find um, our plagiarism policy, which you can download and use as a, a preset page. Also our student behavior policy, which is really, really extensive. But again, I recommend you should put this in 100% of your classes as Solange and others of us know. If you deal with student issues, having all of your policies, including that student behavior policy in your class, is a basic level of backup or foundation that you need. If there's ever a complaint that happens through our processes of expulsion or suspension, if you don't have that in there, um, you probably would be covered under the catalog policy, but I really recommend it, A, that being in there, and B, doing something like a lot of us do, which is to have a very specific discussion policy or student behavior policy. Student conduct rules is what I call it. And then this way, it's emphasized also in your syllabus. And again, I'm linking to all of our policies. I discuss, again, what is slanderous language. I give an example because I, I, I learn of new situations. And believe me, if one of you says this happened in my class and I don't have it in here, I'll, I'll add it for the next quarter because I really feel like we always have to keep up to date with whatever issues are, are out there. So um, Canvas Commons, you can download all that, the policy PDFs. Again, I really recommend having rules of conduct laid out for your discussions. And then this is something new, talking more with uh, colleagues in social sciences, humanities, where I re really feel like more and more I have to tell students how to frame their arguments. This is not a social media post. You need to have proper English, capitalization, punctuation, and you can't just sort of, you know, go on to these rabbit hole banter conversations. You have to really frame your arguments referencing something in the, in the reading for the week. And that is like the big thing. It's maybe not a student conduct issue, but it's more like how they should act professionally when they do their discussions in a class. But Justin, go ahead. You had a, um, a, spe a specific example you wanted to share. Yeah, actually. Um, so two things, because you also said something that reminded me of something else. So one is on 
uh, going back to what he's talked about, you know, this is, these aren't social media posts and yeah. you have proper, you know, grammar and capitalization. So one thing I'm noticing that almost all my, all my students are doing, and I've been giving this to every single student in my feedback since week one. And I suspect that a lot of them are just not reading their feedback anyway. They kind of look at their grade and they're like, okay, I'm happy. And they don't even look at the feedback, but it's like, I, I'm getting a lot of informal contractions and uh, colloquial. Um, so yeah. A lot of informal contractions, you know, can't, shouldn't, wouldn't. Yeah. I'm, and I'm constantly, I have the phrase I use in every feedback. And I just, it just says, um, and by the way, I don't detract points for this. I'll detract yeah. points for grammar and syntax, but, um, but I'll tell them, although I'm not deducting points for this, you should avoid informal contractions in academic writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll put, I'll put example, shouldn't, couldn't, you know, and I'll say, just write these out as the two separate words um, and avoid colloquialism. So I get that sometimes. Um, but they, it's just repeated. So, you know, we're here in week six or seven and um, and I'm still seeing it constantly. Yeah. Um, um, so that was my one question is, or do you see that? How do you deal with it? Do you let it go? Because on one hand, I'm, you know, I'm telling them, I mean, these discussions are graded assignments technically. So, yeah, they're not social media posts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I, could, I mean, you're you're giving me work cited in citations. Right. It doesn't make sense. You're going to do that and then turn around and use a lot of informal language. So, yeah. Whoa. So just your opinions on that. And there's a second uh, sort of issue I've been yeah. experiencing with conduct, you know, but I'll come back to that. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I was looking at mine, and I think what you do is totally fine. Like mine, I talk about the word count, spell check, and grammar. I say, this is not an English class. Demonstrate good writing form. And then I take them to this link of, um, you know, writing conventions for college students. Um, spelling, punctuation, capitalization. So it, it it's fairly straightforward. I think whatever works for your class, like I say specific to the voice of your writing, you could use third person, you can use first. I would prefer first person because I hope, although I found a case ages ago where someone plagiarized, it was very strange. They were actually writing about, um, I thought it was so ironic, they were writing about being a good Christian. This was for the, the religion class. And they plagiarized Someone, they found a blog post online, a first person where someone talked about the tenets uh, of being a good Christian. And I was like, do you see how this is ironic that you're actually plagiarizing and saying you're, you know, anyway. So I've, I've actually found examples of people um, plagiarizing in the first person. But I tend to like the first person because I feel like probably there'll be less plagiarism. I, I could imagine in a humanities class, if you're writing about whatever, there's going to be all these third person accounts on Wikipedia, probably less first person accounts. So I prefer, I think, first person because I hope that it's going to be less possibility for plagiarism. I do state down here, make sure everything is in your own words. I haven't had your issue. I haven't had too many informal things. I've had pretty good grammar and spelling. Students seem pretty sharp. But what I've had is a few students in the cultural class first few weeks, this one student, we weren't even talking about, we were talking about subsistence, and they were talking about a topic from two or three weeks ago, and they were clearly filling up their word count with definitions. They're like, anthropologists define this as this, and anthropologists, and I wrote in their grading, we're not even talking about it this week, and so what I did was I wrote on their grading comments, I deducted points, and I said, as you, as you see here, all the posts must be in your own words. And then I did a second announcement because I felt like this, this was coming up with two or three students where I said, I do not want you to regurgitate definitions for your discussion posts. I want you to give your interpretations and your views on the right on the issues that we're considering. So I think it's perfectly fine. However you define it for your class, what I would recommend is you know, do the follow-ups and maybe if it's two or three students, like I discovered with the repetition of definitions to eat up their word count, then I think it warrants an announcement where you say to the whole class, as a reminder, please don't use contractions or make sure you write it using academic language. And then hopefully that kind of repetition will help with, with that. Yeah, I, I, I did an announcement yesterday on that because uh, I usually grade all the work on, mon on Monday. And then yeah. I send an announcement afterwards that says, you know, your work has been graded. Please see the feedback and, you know, let me know if you have any questions. And usually yeah. after that, I always, I always will add um, a separate paragraph on some like issue that I notice is going on, um, but also praise them like, oh, I noticed everyone's improving from week to week. So keep it up. So, I, you know, I mix a positive and also like improvement advice. Yeah. So yeah. yesterday that was my improvement advice is like, I'm still seeing too many informal contractions. So. You know, let's try to avoid this. Uh, I've been mm -hmm. doing. It. Yeah. 
Now, Justin, your class is a DE class, not a Zoom class. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot harder. Yeah. 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 Um, but moving to the second point, I was going to make yeah, yeah. it. On, okay. So it was actually, well, it's two different issues, but because for the sake of time, I'll just bring up one of them that is coming up. So I've noticed that, you know, I have students that will miss, that won't submit their assignments or I've missed their assignments. Sometimes they reach out to me and will say, oh, I missed it for this reason or that reason. And then um, I usually will send a private message to students that missed assignments and it will be titled check-in and it just says, hey, I'm just checking in, make sure everything's okay. I noticed you missed yeah. this this week and um, yeah, reach out to me um, so we can discuss um, how to you know keep you on track and be successful and so on. And I've had a couple students now that either were caught, either I caught them with a bit of academic dishonesty and we've been working that out um, or they just like weren't submitting their work and I followed up on them. A, a couple of them have said, um, oh, I just, I find your class very difficult. And that's sort of their reason for either not turning in work or maybe a bit of academic dishonesty, um, which is a bit odd to me because um, I responded to them like, okay, well, let me give you some help. Uh, like, what is it What is it in particular that you find to be difficult? Some yeah. of them said, oh, it's the reading. I'm, I read the chapter and I just can't remember what I read or something. So I'll say, okay, well, you know, here's how you can take notes while you're reading to help with memorization and all this and so on. But I wonder if you ever heard this from students, because for me, this is really ironic because, you know, as you, as I mentioned, I, I created this class from scratch, from scratch yes. within a matter of weeks. And um, because of that, um, I gave, I found like a free textbook online that we're using that's uh, created by a, a professor at a community college in Oregon, Portland. So it's, mm -hmm. it's quite an easy textbook. I mean, it's on the level of, like, if you're reading it, it's like almost like a Wikipedia uh, yeah. type of level yeah. of reading. Very easy textbook. Textbook. The the assignments are essentially, you know, the quizzes, the exams, and then just their short discussion posts every week. And um, I have them watch media tasks, which is mostly videos, and then maybe browse a website that I want them to look at a website, mm -hmm. and go through, and then a lot of primary text readings which yeah. I always I always ensure that they're like um, excerpts, you mm -hmm. know, because I give them multiple texts all week. So I don't want them to read like a whole long book. So it's always excerpts or just, you know, of these short things. So, so I'm just thinking, like, what is it, what could possibly be difficult about this? In, in my opinion, this this is probably below average in terms of, of difficulty. So yeah, so that was a long way of asking you if you've ever experienced students kind of like saying, oh, your class is too difficult or I really don't understand your class very well and using that as an excuse for some other conduct like not doing their work or play getting caught for doing something yeah. wrong i don't know i've just this has happened from like two students maybe three so far and so i'm really curious but i have students that have like 95 percent in the class right now and yeah, you know 89 percent yeah. and i'm like well a lot of students are doing quite well so i'm not sure how many in your how many yeah. in your class justin um, I think I'm down to 18 now. Started okay. with close to 30, and then now it's like at 18. But yeah, um, yeah, most of them are A's and B's, a handful of C's, yeah. and then some that are like on the D mark or under. Yeah. Um, but those are the ones that are giving me that, you know, that excuse of oh, oh, this is too difficult. I don't understand your class. I, I get a few of those, but never, um, I usually don't get it during the term. I would get it in the evaluations. If the class was being evaluated, they would say, this exact thing the readings are too hard there are too many readings too many videos to watch or something right now what i'm getting more of is just the one off like um i had a a student in in one of my classes and she seemed really concerned about um one of the discussion topics about the family it touched close to home and said oh i i couldn't do my second discussion it was so personal to me i'm really stressed so i wrote on it and said okay how can I help you? Do you want, we have mental health services on campus. We're starting this new mental health club, Active Minds. I was like, how can I help you? How can, and it's exactly what happened with one of Justin's students just fell off the face of the earth. And I never heard back from the student again. So now I'm like, huh, do I follow up with a counselor? Because I was really trying to be caring. And I said, okay, this sounds bad. It sounded legit. Like it was a trigger of something that she read um, and it sounded really legit. And I thought, how can I help you? And I haven't heard back. So I probably will follow up in, in a few days. And then I just got another one, a student saying, my life has been crazy this week. And um, and I and it sounded like maybe she was 
pre kind of setting up like an excuse, but I, I have to go and check and see if she did her discussions. Sometimes students will write to me and just say, you know, I didn't do a good job this week, but um, I, I did what I could and I'm just letting you know, kind of as a, an apology or something. But I, I have very few during the quarter that say um, it's too much reading. Instead, I think those students probably just don't keep up with things and they start to fail the class. It's surprising that in a sense, it's good they're being honest, but then it's like maybe the response could be like, well, you know, do you need to sit down and talk with your counselor? Because if you're taking multiple classes, if you're taking anatomy and physiology or art history, I guarantee it's way more reading than they're doing for their humanities, for their DMA or their anthro combined. I mean, some of those A&P classes, you have to do so much memorization, art history, the, the books are this thick. So it's kind of surprising that they're complaining about this because I'm sure they have much more reading in other classes. I feel the same way about mine. Like my class is too easy, but yet students fail. So, yeah. Um, how do you, how do the students download lectures? Lectures or um, readings? Readings. So for readings, they could do it um, a number of different ways. They could download it from the files tab. They can, um, they're, I think they're not linked on the syllabus, but the best way would be to go to the discussions. Um, and I'll show you one here, like week six discussion. Um, I think they're under the modules too. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, my readings are in the module. Yeah, right here. So they would just click the download button. Yeah, and it's very specific. Again, all, for students who want to do homemade instruments, they could read all these. If they just want to focus on... Um, music and sound they could you know click on these they're also in the modules too yeah um yeah. under under readings yeah i have them in multiple places yep so right here yeah and they could also just click on it and uh open it in the browser too it'll appear in the browser yeah and then they can copy it off the browser yep they could either read it there they could um they could download the whole thing or they could um go to files. So there's like three or four places they could do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. If you're using an open source textbook in my cultural class, what's, what's kind of nice is the book is available in all the electronic formats. So um, you could click on the reading for that week and then you could go to the main page. This is published by the American Anthropological Association. And then you can choose all these different formats. Read online, download chapters, order print version, download entire book. So that, that's kind of nice because then they can choose the format. So, yeah. Okay. Um, my other question was regarding students and now I forgot what it was. What were we talking about earlier, Justin? Um, about readings, oh, about, about readings, talking about the class being like too difficult, too hard. Oh. Okay, do you spend time with your students during office hours or do you offer your time to be able to work with your students online? Oh, interesting. What, what, the second part of your question. So to answer it, uh, office hours, but what do you mean work with them online? Like help, help them work through the material or what do you mean? Yeah, I have students who have classes during my office hours. And so I offer them my services like at night, like for, you know, a half hour oh. or something like that. I give them the opportunity to um, get online with me to work on these projects. I'm a okay. project-based class. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah, my class is in project basis. Um, so, I, that, so I wouldn't, I haven't mentioned like working with them through the material, but I do um, every week have my office hours and I'm very clear on, I have the same verbiage I use on every announcement about it, uh, which I send out twice, three times a week that, um, that first of all, I've rotated days of the week to so it gives if students have other classes they can maybe come to another another day but i also have the verbiage that if you cannot make the office hours then uh please arrange a one-to-one -one zoom meeting with me at a okay. time that's convenient for you yeah mm -hmm. so i've had a few take me up on that but um uh yeah by and large a lot of students just don't come <laughs> to, right uh, now yeah. i know of a i know of an instructor who actually has a requirement in her DE class, they are required to do a Zoom meeting with her. What are your thoughts about that, Dr. Scott? Well, we've been told that even if it's an EVE and you're supposed to do Zoom, or if it's DE and you have the required 
Zoom meeting, we're, we're told that you should have um, a makeup opportunity. So what I tried to do in my class this quarter didn't work. I had two students in each of the Zooms I did. I said, if you don't want to do your week one discussions as text, log on for 45 minutes, participate in the Zoom, and I'll give you the credit for. So it was like one or the other. So I, I've heard that we're not supposed to, according to the Chancellor's Office, have a required Zoom because during COVID, a lot of work schedules are up in the air. And so you're supposed to have a makeup opportunity for that Zoom. So I think you could say, I want you to do the Zoom. But then the backup is, if you can't, you can do the discussion board and still get full credit. This is what I've heard from the administration, that you're not supposed to do totally 100% required Zoom. So, yeah, and that, that makes sense for DE classes because all yeah. kind of the point is that, like, yeah. you know, um, is that you're you can't be available for a specific time, and so you do it at your own pace at your own yeah. time. But well, but I but uh, so long to your question. Um, in the UK, at the institutions I was at, all undergrads had had to have um, either one or usually two meetings with the um, lecturer of the course uh, for the whole term. Usually, like in the somewhere in the first third and somewhere in the last third of the of the term, mm -hmm. um, and they called it a tutorial. Um, but usually the way the tutorial was also done was, was oftentimes um, around a, an essay assignment. So okay. they, would, they would have to meet with you with, to give you their outline and to go over what their plan was for their essay. But I, as part of that, it was also to talk about like how you're doing in the class and clarify any questions and so on. So that was like right. a mandatory, well, mandatory, we used the word compulsory. It was a compulsory <laughs> tutor session. Uh, I like the verb, but yeah, it was a tutor session. Uh, it was compulsory. Um, but yeah, whether or not, and that was in person, I was when I was teaching in person, but we also, when I was teaching online, I had to do it via Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. but that was a bit different. Those were like, that was more like the EVE classes we have here where yeah. we would have, um, our lecture was a scheduled like Wednesdays at a certain time and it was a live Zoom lecture. So those were not fully online. And I guess that's why we, we were able to say you have a mandatory, you know, meeting, but, um, yeah. for the fully online, I could see why that, why you, we couldn't really push that. Yeah. I just feel that some of my students are intimidated by meeting with their professor online. They, I had yeah. a student today who was, who was so afraid of her Zoom meeting today was my office hours. And she was so afraid, but after a while, she warmed up quite a bit. But she was very intimidated by meeting with me online. And I want to meet all of my students online. And I've mm -hmm. not quite figured out how to do that yet. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it, it definitely helps break the ice. And, uh, um, but yeah, I noticed a few that I've met with, you could tell there's, they're, they're, they were kind of like shy at first. And yeah, yeah. So, so I was the first thing I say when they come on the camera, this is my first time seeing them, is like, as before the meeting, I would go refresh my memory of their introduce yourself post. So mm -hmm. I would say, oh, so you work over at this place, or so you're, you know, you're interested in this hobby or sport, and tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, and ask them, oh, so you're full time or part time, and what other classes are you taking? And by that time, usually, then it's they're good to go, and I can say, okay, now let's talk about this academic dishonesty. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Personalize and make them feel comfortable. When I did that optional Zoom, the first one, I was like, okay, this will be my week one lecture. But then what happened was, it was so not like the students were so like you're saying, Solange, they were afraid, they weren't saying much that I just kind of left it to, okay, I'll answer your questions. I'll talk a little bit about myself, about the class. But they were so disengaged that I couldn't even focus. You know, like if you're doing a public lecture or presentation, you know, sure, people are sometimes falling asleep in the back, but you feel like the setting is like, okay, people are here to, to listen to this lecture. And I just felt like it wasn't working doing the Zooms. So I immediately shifted. And now it's it's way more work because to do one of these lectures, I have to prep the PowerPoint, I have to do the recording, do all the editing, you know, it's, it takes um, almost an entire day to do one of these lectures for one of the two classes. And that's, that's a lot of time. So I've been working seven days a week this quarter. And it's like, uh, it's just because of these lectures, they're just so much work. Um, and they're two brand new classes, because I've taught culturals going back to the 90s, but um, never with this book, and it's a brand new class. So I, I feel like, Hopefully th these lectures I'm doing will pay off the next time I teach it because um, I don't find the Zooms have worked for me. I want the Zooms to work, but they're just too weird. The dynamic is too weird socially. 
So, and I know because we're running out of time, but yeah, maybe, maybe we could talk about this for a, another teaching talk is um, lectures for DE classes specifically. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm wondering, and especially because yeah. I need to start preparing for these ones that I got for winter and spring. But yeah. Same thing I'm wondering now, you know, if people are not even watching these lectures, like you said, I did, I'm taking, I usually do them on Tuesdays. I do them before, or if I don't have time, I'll do them after the teaching talk. Yeah, yeah it's an all day process. And then yeah. um, I tried to go to my insights. I don't know if it was working correctly because I couldn't see the number of people that were viewing them. But, oh, okay. but, but, but I suspect that there's not a lot just from those that are clicking on the page anyway. Yeah. So because of that, um, I guess, I guess going into this DE class being new at Tahoe, I thought like it was almost like mandatory, like you have to have a lecture of some sort. And, and I come from the UK with my education. So it's like, that's what you do, you do a lecture. So, but hearing from you that like, you, know, you don't even do them for some classes or like Solange has the written lectures and stuff. So now I'm wondering like, maybe this isn't the best method and use of my time for, um, for content for them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I feel like something's missing if I just tell them, oh, here, do all these readings and media tasks and do your assignments. Um, mm -hmm. I almost felt like I'm, if I can be candid, like I'm not doing my job in some way because yeah. I'm not getting the yeah. lecture. But then like Solange says, yeah, these videos are if they're over like 20 minutes. These students aren't going to want to watch them. And I have some that are like 30, 40 minutes and I feel like students yeah. probably still are like, that's too long and I'm not going to watch it. So anyway, so yeah, I'm just wondering, and I'm kind of committed now, so I don't want to stop doing lectures midway through yeah. this. So I'm going to finish it off, but, um, but going forward, I kind of want to figure it out sooner than later. So as I start building these next classes, my D class, yeah. I can decide like, am I just going to do something different? Yeah, I, I feel the same way like you do. I feel like if we don't have something that guides students through, but again, like Solange is doing, it could be an online practical tutorial. Um, I've seen instructors that don't engage on their discussion board. So I think there needs to be something that ties together material because again, you're the expert, you're the pro who's teaching the class. Um, we can never really make it mandatory. Now, the way you could is start quizzing students on the lectures, right? So say, you know, there's something very specific you discuss. Like one of my lectures, I talked about an example of cultural appropriation. I said, was the example of sombrero, dreadlocks, um, uh, a burrito, you know, and I give these four. And if you watch a lecture, you're going to know. And I could tell immediately people that picked a burrito. Nope, they didn't They didn't watch the lecture. So I feel like that's the best bet to try to get them engaged is to do a mini quiz on the lecture. Because otherwise, I do agree with Solange, I, I don't think students will watch. I don't even know if they'll watch the 10-minute lecture. So it's it may not even be the time. It's more like that commitment and motivation. Sorry, go ahead. That's a good point. Yeah. And the reason why I'm hesitant to do a write like a written lecture is because for humanities, um, I don't think I can do that because I'm already having to read so much. I have to read the textbook yeah. and read yeah. the primary text. So but at the same time, I'm making them watch you know, videos and then they have to watch a lecture video. So I don't know. I guess I, just, I feel like they'd be more inclined to watch a video than, than read more. But um, I, I'm already doing something similar to what you said, Scott, but not maybe not exactly the way you said it is I do tell them that for their quizzes and for their um, exams that those will contain content or can and will contain content from their textbook reading, primary mm -hmm. text readings, media tasks, and the lecture and the video lectures, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one or two out of, you know, the questions on the exam might be some detail I went over in the lecture, but I, I, I don't know if that's much, as much of an incentive. So maybe what you said just gave me the idea of maybe making like a whole quiz based upon yeah. Um, yeah. the lecture. So. Yeah, I have to think about that. That was, that was a good point. Yeah, yeah, quiz every week. Quiz every week. You could. Um, but I wrote that down. That'll fit in actually nicely. I'm thinking there's a talk coming up and we'll plug that in too, um, you know, doing lectures. Um, and just as a reminder, next week's there's a, I'm double booked at, at 12. There's actually two events. Um, student Success Grant um, Award winners. And actually, uh, I'll be doing a project along with uh, Michael McGill. We are awarded a small grant. Uh, focused on student and technology in Canvas. So I'll, I'll announce some more about that. Um, next week at noon, I hope they'll do it hybrid. It's the honor roll celebration. So if it is hybrid, um, you're welcome to attend that. I think an announcement will go out um, shortly. So we'll be dark next week and we'll be back the following week. And then I think there'll be two more after that kind of um, rounding up the quarter. But I love the topic about lectures. So I think we'll do a, uh, we'll add that to one of the upcoming workshops for sure. 
Um, yeah, so kind of closing this out, you know, student motivation and behavior, I think it's always what we do, right? We try to think of ways to motivate our students to do the readings, to come to the office hours, to watch le lectures, watch the videos. It's always that challenge of teaching is, is motivation. So um, yeah, great discussion today. Any other thoughts or comments as we close here? I know we went over. Thank you very much, Dr. Scott. Yeah, thank, yes, yeah. I appreciate both of your um, participation today and I will uh, share this video once it's done. And uh, yeah, all right. Well, good luck with your classes and all that student motivation work. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. For sure. Okay, great day. Have a great day. Yeah. Bye.